introduction. Um, my name is Lawrence Flynn. I'm the CEO of Artificial Solutions, which is a European-based software company. We specialize in the natural language interaction end of AI. Um, we have built a software development platform to support that, and we target uh, large enterprise use cases. Um, we do that across 35 different languages. Uh, we're based in the US out of uh, Mountain View, not very far away. So I'm trying to talk to you today from an enterprise perspective, addressing the issue of the surviving of the AI onslaught. Um, I think there's testament through the sold out nature of this conference that AI is a big topic on the agenda of all enterprises today. And, and I want to uh, take a look at that um, and recognize that that actually constitutes a major challenge for the enterprise today, a major problem for business. And I want to start doing that by basically addressing one question. That question is, what if? And I'll give you three examples of that. What if there was a way to provide people with overnight accommodation without having to own a hotel? Or maybe, what if there was a way to transport from people from A to B in a convenient air-conditioned vehicle without having to own a single car? Or what if there was a way to provide people with all the goods that they wanted, everything they ever wished to buy, without having to own a single store? Those three, I think, pretty readily identifiable what-if companies have been hugely disruptive in marketplaces. They've changed entirely landscapes against competitors. And what I want to look at today is what if you're not one of those companies and what if you are another large-scale enterprise and how do you respond to that in the context of artificial intelligence? So I wanted to pick another question that might help us frame that, okay? And, and obviously, I'm going to give away my secrets of my next entrepreneurial mission, so I'm not going to give you a, 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 a what-if question like that, but something more neutral, okay? So bear with me here. What if trees could walk? By the way, I learned that this is the Stanford mascot. I, I didn't know that at all, but um, that's, that's just a lucky guess. Right? So, I want us to look at this concept, and bear with me, it is a real point to this in relation to the enterprise. What if trees could walk? Well, I guess some of them might discover a previously unknown passion for snowboarding. Some of them may be, you know, decided that a beachside lifestyle is much more appropriate for them. The truth is, like all other species, trees would look at this and see how they could put it to work, what advantage they could get in terms of Darwinian principles. So they'd be looking at how can I use this gift of being able to walk to maximize my outcomes for success in reproduction. They would, they would use this to become unrooted, to be able to move to the best area. And the analogy is that in business today, there's a huge wind of change. And many businesses remain rooted in their comfort zones around uh, AI and other technological advances which have fundamentally changed their landscape, allowing other what-if companies to come in and cause disruptions. In today's landscape, businesses are having to deal with a permanently connected world, a permanently mobile connected world. Social media is a, a, huge, uh, a, a huge shift in behavior, particularly for millennial generations. And we can see that the what if companies that I mentioned before are all companies that have seized upon this to, to make advantage of it whereas we also know of a great many companies that failed to respond, that failed to recognize the changing landscape around them and didn't walk over to somewhere where there was more favorable conditions to do that. So how might these um, companies protect themselves then? And how might, they, uh, how might they address this issue? 
Well, I'm going to use the word that I'm sure is probably only going to be said about 50,000 times over the course of these two days. It's to do with data. And um, studies show us that 90% of business decision making is made on hunch, on the absence of data. And paradoxically, businesses that make data-informed decisions are twice as likely to succeed. Okay. Now, I think we can see examples of that from the tech giants, who are sat probably on the largest amounts of data of anybody in, in the enterprise world, and they're able to make informed decisions about which sectors to focus on and which sectors to disrupt as a direct consequence of owning that data. So even though they're already huge businesses, they're able to become successful in new territories because they know, Apple knows which apps you're using. Google knows what you're searching for and you know, nobody understands your shopping cart any better than Amazon. So they're able to make informed decisions based on hard data and that actually gives them the dual advantage of de-risking decisions, uh, implementing business changes. Okay. But what if you're not a tech giant? Okay. Well, for you, data is the map. If you are this walking tree with this newly found gift, data enables you to figure out where to go such that the conditions will be optimal for you. Now, when I'm talking about data here, I'm not just talking about big data. When I talk to our customers and prospects, they say, yeah, data, we've got it. The IT guy's got that nailed. I think it's called big data, and it's so big, we have to keep it a lake. <laughs> but that's the data they could get. That's the traditional data that existed within the enterprise, the transactional data that, that they had. And that's no longer enough. Okay? It's no longer enough because most enterprises have become disconnected from their customers. For one simple reason. They chose to embrace these technologies, different waves of technological advancement, and artificial intelligence is no different. They've chosen to focus on areas of optimizing their business, reducing their costs predominantly. And instead, they are not reaching out to embrace their customers, to get customer proximity through this data. And this disconnect has led to problems for our enterprises. And here we get the, the second objection. They say, well, wait, wait, wait. We, what do you mean? We, of course, we talk to our customers all the time. We've got a 24 by 7, 365 call center. Okay. Well, many of you, I'm sure, have enjoyed the call center experience know how valuable you feel as a customer as a result of that. In fact, one study, I can't name the company, it's a little embarrassing. They did a survey about it and a middle-aged American lady said, she described it as she would rather take a bath with her father than phone the call center. And so, so there's two problems with the call center argument. One, it's a horrible experience. Two, you have to be in so much pain to call the call center that you are no longer representative of the customer base. Okay. So enterprises need to reach out across this disconnect. And how do they do that? Well, they need to engage their customers in ways that are contemporaneous with what they're seeing from other people. Most commonly what they're seeing from the other tech giants. They have to have outreach, which is every bit as intelligent every bit as engaging as that which they see provided by those tech giants. And of course they have to do that in the context of not having the same data and not having the same resources and not having the same skilled scientists on their, uh, on their payroll. But you have to start somewhere and most businesses are not succeeding in this, uh, in this area because they are failing to capture the voice of their customer. Many of you have seen different models for data. This is a 4A model. So it's acquire, aggregate, analyze, and act. Pretty standard stuff. 
But the problem for the enterprise of today in many cases, despite having this big data lake, is that they are failing with the very first A. They are failing to capture the first person singular voice of their customer. They need to be able to capture that at enormous scale. Okay? And the reason that they're not capturing and acquiring this data is because they're not able to engage their customers across the customer disconnect with applications that intrigue and uh, engage their customers. And they work worse still, they risk reaching out to customers with applications that fall short of the customer expectations. Customer expectations that are set by companies with large budgets, with large amounts of data and with cool technologists on their payroll. So they risk damaging their brand unless they can build something that is genuinely human-like, genuinely intelligent and genuinely capable. And they must exceed the customer's expectations, otherwise they will actually have a, a, a negative effect on NPS scores and so on. Well, what can we do about that? Well, I, I can tell you a little bit about artificial solutions and what we're doing about it. Uh, and it's encapsulated in this. Okay? E to E for E. So let me explain, first of all, what they stand for. The first Three-fifths, 60%, is E to E stands for end to end. Okay? And then we have for enterprise. So let me articulate a little bit about what I mean when I say end to end. Well, firstly, end to end means that you have to be able to maintain the whole life cycle. As an enterprise, and not relying on a third party, you have to control the engaging experience that you're going to put in the hands of your customers and consumers. Which means that you have to be able to build applications. You can't let that be left to whether or not somebody finds you on a search engine or what have you. You have to be able to build those in a time that is practical for your business cycles, at a budget that is affordable to your business needs, and yet you have to build things that are every bit as intelligent as other applications that are out there without hiring an army of computational linguists. So you need a set of tools, a platform, if you will, like our Tenio platform that enables you to build applications. Not only do you build them, you have to deploy them. You have to be able to address your customers wherever they are across the, uh, uh, across the disconnect. And in so doing, you have to deploy at scale, hundreds of millions of transactions, millisecond responses. And of course, that's only the start of the journey, because in engaging with your customers, you solve for the first problem. You solve for the problem that you haven't acquired the data. So once you acquire this data, and not all data is equal, this is first person singular voice of the customer data, which is hugely valuable as an asset to the enterprise. But it is also difficult data because it's conversational, it's unstructured and it's not its natural language. So it's not just a question of being able to capture the data, it's also a question of being able to analyze that data. I mean analyze that in the context of a business. What's working, what's not working, how do we improve and so on. And because we are uh, doing this at such a scale with large enterprises reaching out in many cases to literally hundreds of millions of customers, we have to use AI techniques like machine learning to be able to, to make those improvements happen. And of course the final A was that they had to act. They had to leverage the data to enable them to change the way in which they engage with their customers in some way, either for product improvement, marketing initiatives, responses to problems, and so on and so forth. And the second way in which the end-to-end -end is important is that it's not possible for enterprises to determine where their customers live. They can't dictate to them that they're only going to talk to people who've got an Android phone. They can't say you can only deal with us on one given social media platform. 
or one messaging platform, or one wearable device. And yet, that enterprise has to be able to build an on-brand and engaging experience which is 100% consistent in the eyes of the customer across every single one of those channels. So the enterprise therefore can't choose to use different technology to solve for every different communication channel. The enterprise must make a strategic investment in an AI platform that enables them to build applications that can be deployed in any eventuality. If you remember the times of the internet revolution, it started very similar to what we're seeing today, where hobbyists, people, today we might call them bot builders, go out and build using one technology. And then they have to, hold on a minute, this is now an enterprise thing, so I've got to replicate that experience somewhere else, but that technology doesn't deploy for that, and then I've got to reintegrate it with all my back-end systems. It's not the way to go. It's not the way that we would do that in the web content management world today, and it's not the way that we need to do it in the AI world of tomorrow. We need to focus on a platform that can address a consistent on-brand experience for all of our customers, no matter where they are. And the final bit of the enter end for enterprise was 4E. And perhaps this is the most literal thing that it can be. It means that the platform has to be for the enterprise. It's not for anybody else. It's for them. It's for them to control. It's for them to own the experience that's created through it. And above all, it's for them to utilize to clean the data. They don't want to share that data, first person singular voice of the customer data, with anybody who isn't there. They don't want other people, other what if companies, to be able to exploit that data to disrupt their marketplaces. And if it's 4E, it means it has to be an enterprise strength application. Which means boring things, right? It means it's got to be capable of withstanding uh, security tests. It's got to have version control and rollback, things that are not glamorous, but you know what? They don't get in the IT stack unless they're there. It has to be multi-user because no one person can build it. It's at a scale that's different. You have to enable the collaboration between subject matter experts, developers, and customer experience managers in order to be able to do it. So we very much see that the way to solve for the problem of acquiring data is to make a strategic investment in a platform to address all of those disparate E to E needs. And what that means is that for us as a company, we are in the business of helping our enterprise customers not become rooted trees, not become blown over by the ever increasing wind of change but enabling them to have a map, a data-driven map that tells them where to go to optimize their chances of survival. So just one final thing by way of some summary. We're talking about surviving the AI onslaught. It's a hugely con confusing landscape for enterprises, but they have a very, very real problem. They have a very real problem that they know that unless they are agile, and adopt the technologies to suit their purposes, they stand the risk of being exterminated by new what-if companies. In order to do that, they can't do that through hunch. They have to reach out across the customer disconnect and acquire the data, the first person singular voice of the customer data that is currently not being captured adequately. <coughs> They need to exceed user expectations. They need to make sure that their brand values are incorporated in these applications, but they never compromise. They never look bad as a result of embracing the AI technologies. And they need to do that in a way that is end-to-end -end enterprise. It's scalable, it's deployable in the enterprise world. In our case, that's just the thing, you know, we have the, one of the few advantages of being a European software company is that, you know, we currently work in 35 languages. Well, enterprises have got to address that problem, right? It has to be enterprise strength. It has to be complete life cycle, everything in one team, and it has to address all channels because the consumer will choose. 
So, all of this points to one thing and one thing only, that embracing this natural language AI technology is going to be mission critical to the CIO of 2020. It's a technology that they can no longer avoid to have as part of their core technology stack, just as they would have an ERP system today. Okay, well, I think I've pretty much stuck to time there. I hope, uh, I hope you all uh, enjoyed that, and um, I don't know if we're going to have any questions or... Okay, well, at least I'm, you've had enough of me, and now you can get some lunch. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Very, uh, very insightful and interesting.